You know, I've always wanted to write. I think it comes from being from a family of storytellers in northern Arkansas that sit up on the front porch and they told stories all the time. My grandparents were incredible storytellers. And I think once that is ingrained in your DNA, you just want to write. I think one of the most important things about being a writer that makes you probably a successful writer is curiosity. If you don't have curiosity about things, you're probably not going to be a very good storyteller. You've got to know the story behind things, how things work. And I've been that way since I was a little kid. I probably drove my teachers crazy, but it's what's driven me alive. I want to find out the story behind everything. I have a very deep love of history. I always have. History is something that fascinates me because if you don't know history, then you're not going to be able to predict the future. And when you write, even if you're writing something set in modern times, you have to know how you got there. History is vital. It's important. It teaches us so much, and I am constantly reading more and more about history. If I watch a movie, I've got to know what the stars did before they were actors. I want to know who wrote the movie, who directed the movie. In that sense, I want to know all the details. When I'm writing a novel, and if it's set in the 1940s, I'm reading 1940s history from that perspective. I'm looking at movie magazines, listening to music, watching the movies from that era. History is so important, I think, to being a good fiction or nonfiction writer. You have to be interested in it, you have to know it, and you have to constantly, constantly be looking at it. My writing style comes from so many different areas and so many different regions. I mean, obviously, you're taught to write when you're in elementary school, high school, and college. But really, my pacing and my style, be it fiction or nonfiction, is derived a great deal from 1930s movies and 1930s, 40s, and 50s radio. Uh, in studying those particular genres of media, I found that the pacing they used, the storytelling ideas that they used, the ability to describe something in a hurry with dialogue was something that translated very, very well to my writing style. And therefore, I may be a little different writer than most people are because I'm not looking at classic literature for my outline. I'm looking at classic radio. If you want to know what drives me, listen to Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Uh, uh, Blake Edwards wrote a lot of those episodes. Listen or, to The Saint. Uh, in old radio. In movies, watch a movie in 1936 called Libel Lady and listen to the rapid-fire dialogue and how it drives the movie and creates a image and a picture that translates so well to literature. I write both fiction and nonfiction, and people ask me all the time, how do you make that transition from one to the other? And really, in my mind, there's not much of a transition. Uh, they are both involved storytelling. Um, I guess the main difference is the fact that in fiction you're only limited by your imagination. Nonfiction, therefore, is much tougher to write because you're limited by the facts. And therefore, I think it takes a lot more time to write a really good nonfiction story because those facts are your outline. You can't go outside those facts. So when I write something that's nonfiction, then I'm, I'm in a situation where I really have to be involved more with how do you tell the story differently than it's ever been told before. And I think that's the key in nonfiction is coming up with a new way to tell a story that's been told several times before. I am very much a people watcher. If I go to airports or to a school or to a restaurant, I'm watching people. I watch how they walk, how they talk, how they act. And I think that's essential to being a good writer is that curiosity about people and where they're coming from, what they're doing, looking at their mannerisms, finding out how unique each one of them is. And so I think one of the strengths I have as a writer is how much I love to watch and learn from people. So in a very real sense, if you see me in an airport or you see me at a school, I'm realistically speaking sitting there taking it all in as a spectator so that I can learn more about who those people are and what they do in the environment that they're in. You know, that's a question I get asked a lot. Do you ever run out of stories? And the truth is, so far I haven't. As a matter of fact, whenever I think of a story or a really good line, I write it down. It doesn't make a difference where I am. I'll pull off the side of the road and jot it down on my iPhone. I will write it down on the back of a piece of paper I can find, or a newspaper, or a napkin. Whenever a story idea comes, 
I'm going to write it down. I think that's one of the key things you have to do because if you say, well, I'm going to remember that later, a lot of times you've forgotten it. If you look in my file cabinet right now, you'll find more than a hundred different church bulletins that are filled up with book ideas. I think when you look at books, you're looking at three different ones that jump out. They aren't my favorites necessarily, but they're the ones that I think have made or can make the greatest impact. One is the Christie winner, The Color of Justice. Uh, that book broached a subject that makes people feel uncomfortable, racism. I thought it took a lot of courage for Abington Press to release it. Uh, but this particular novel hit chords that I think are very, very important in our society today and made readers look at the prejudice in their own lives as they examine the plot in the novel. Therefore, I think there was a power in The Color of Justice that uh, is unique. And it's something that I captured once, and whether I'll ever capture it again, I don't know. When you're looking at nonfiction books, let's look at the stories behind the best love songs of Christmas, and its sequel, if you will, the stories behind the great traditions of Christmas, because Christmas songs and traditions enhance the holidays for us. And once you get to know the stories behind them, uh, you appreciate those traditions and those songs so much more. Your holidays mean so much more. Those books have been bestsellers for 15 years, and they continue to take me all over the globe on radio talking about Christmas every year. So those books are very important to me because of the impact they've made on the market. And Service Tales, the, the sequel to Man's Best Hero, I think, is going to be another one of those books because it reveals the potential of man and the potential of the dogs that serve man. And therefore, I think it opens up people's minds and will open up people's minds to the potential of how we can use animals to enhance our lives as people. And I think that's a very, very important subject that needs to be broached in the information age. Sometimes it's not technology that changes us. It's another living creature working with us. Teamwork, if you will. And I'm a big, big believer in teamwork. One of the most unique challenges I've been offered is from Elk Lake Publishing Company. Uh, they're having me take a character and continue a character through a number of episodes. I've already written 10 episodes of In the President's Service with Helen Meeker, a character that was actually born in a book called The Yellow Packard. And this has allowed me to expand uh, a character in ways I've never been able to in the past. And it also gives me an opportunity to write a complete episode, kind of like a television episode, each and every 45 to 60 days. That puts a lot of pressure on me. It keeps me in, uh, fresh, and it allows me to connect with fans in a very, very unique way, too, as they get involved totally in this character that they know is not going to go away. They know that in 60 more days, they're going to get to read another adventure or episode, if you will, in this series. So I think In the President's Service has given me an opportunity to hone my skills as much as anything I've ever written, and also given me a rare opportunity as a writer to enhance characters that I do truly, truly love to write about. Plus, it's set in World War II, and I think World War II is one of the most fascinating times in American history. Uh, there's no doubt. It's Matthew 25, 35 through 40, reaching out to the least of these. I think a lot of us embrace John 3:16, great scripture, but if that is where your spiritual story begins and ends, then how much value does it have when you add Matthew 25, 35 through 40, reaching out to the least of these, you are living the gospel. And so therefore, when I think of scripture that is meaningful to me, that's the scripture that rings out. It's also the scripture you're gonna find in a lot of my books, both fiction and nonfiction, that drives characters as well. What's my favorite quote? It comes from Albert Schweitzer. He was giving it to a college graduating class. And he said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but I do know the only ones among you who will truly be happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. In my mind, that's the key to happiness. Find a way to serve others. Don't live for yourself, but live for others. And I think you're going to find that you will have a very, very happy and rich life. I'm an old basketball player. I'm also an old high school basketball coach. And I love the team approach. The team approach is everything in writing to me. There is never an I project. It's a we project. I work with editors, I work with people who design the covers, I work with marketing people. Those people show me the holes in my work. They give me an idea of what direction I need to go. 
my agent is the one who sells the project. Without the team behind me, then I wouldn't be talking to you about whatever book I'm working on right now. It's the team that makes writing special. And I think it's the teen approach to life that makes it the most meaningful. What's my favorite part of writing? Gosh, there's two parts that I just love. One's the creation element, where you come up with the idea, where you stop and you think, oh, this will make a good idea for a book, either nonfiction or fiction, either one. This is something that we can go places no one's ever been before. And, and the discovery process, the creation process, I think is, is so vital and so important. I think the other facet of writing that really speaks to me is the opportunity to take someone to a place that they've never been via storytelling. Uh, storytelling is so important in my life. It, it's who I am. It's what I do. If you were to sit down and watch a baseball game with me, I'd probably be telling you a story and wanting to hear your stories as well. And so the opportunity, therefore, to get paid for telling a story is one of the most amazing gifts I've ever been given. One of the biggest blessings of this business is getting to tell stories about people who have impacted my life. A classic example would be Shelby Seabaugh, a young woman who died a couple of years ago. Shelby impacted my life in so many different ways. And Shelby was just 21 when she died, but she made a tremendous impact on other people. And being a writer, I've been able to tell Shelby's story in print and in interviews for years. And that's one of the blessings of being a writer is being able to continue stories. Beyond writing, what are the things I love? I love classic cars. I've got a 1934 Auburn and a 1965 Mustang. As you can see behind me, I've got a 1957 Wurlitzer jukebox. And if you saw this whole room, it's a room that looks like a 1960s diner. My office is done in Art Deco, 1930s Hollywood. So I love history. I love collecting things. I have been blessed because I have an incredible wife who's chair of the education department at Wachita Baptist University who constantly challenges me intellectually and has been such an important part of my writing career. I've got two very talented sons. And I think maybe the thing that I love the most about my life is the fact that every Sunday night we have between 50 and 70 college kids that come into our house and they eat with us and we talk and we visit and those college kids give me insight into what their lives are all about. And getting to know those college kids, uh, one, it keeps me young. It keeps me aware of what's going on in the world. But two, it also gives me a tremendous, tremendous optimism on what's going to happen in the future. Because the kids that I'm around are service oriented. They love doing things for other people. And I think when you have that kind of, of go-to spirit, you're looking at some young people who are not just going to change the world, but they're gonna fix some of the problems that we've created in the past. I think the word's blessed. I've been blessed. I get to do what I love to do for a living. I'm married to an incredible woman. I've got a great family. I'm surrounded by people who constantly challenge me. I live in an incredibly beautiful part of the world. Um, so there is no doubt that what I have at this stage in my life is blessings that go beyond measure. And believe me, I never take those for granted.